Would you like to attend a medical school that is really outstanding in community service and community engagement? Tune in. I'm speaking today to Associate Dean for Admissions at Rush Medical College, the 2020 winner of the Spencer Foreman Award for Outstanding Community Engagement. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Thanks for joining me for the 441st episode of Admission Straight Talk. Will you be ready next spring to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Med School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz. Again, it's accepted.com slash med quiz. Complete the quiz and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take the short quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz to obtain your free assessment. Now let's move on to today's interview. I'm delighted to have on Admission Straight Talk, Dr. Cynthia Boyd of Rush Medical College. Dr. Boyd earned her MD at George Washington, where she also did her residency in internal medicine, and later an MBA from Chicago Booth. She joined Rush Medical Center in 1998 and has served in a variety of roles, including Assistant Dean for Minority Affairs, Director of Medical Staff Operations, and Chief Compliance Officer. She moved over to Rush Medical College full-time in 2019, and now is a Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion, as well as Associate Dean for Admissions and Recruitment. Dr. Boyd, thank you so much for joining me on Admission Straight Talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Can you give us an overview of the Rush Medical College program, focusing on some more distinctive elements? Sure. So I'll be speaking uh, primarily about the medical school. Uh, first, uh, Rush University Medical Center, the university, we have four uh, colleges dedicated to the health sciences, the College of Nursing, Health Sciences, Graduate College, and um, the Medical College. Um, it has been in existence since about 1837. It was the first medical school established actually in Chicago. It is very focused on clinical care, outstanding clinical care, uh, integrating that with education, research, and uh, community partnerships. So we are located on the west side of uh, Chicago, about five miles from uh, the downtown area, the Chicago Loop as it is called, and um, our community is a very diverse community ranging from uh, very wealthy to uh, the very poor. More recently, our curriculum was changed to become, become what is described as a flipped classroom where the students do the learning. The teacher's not in front of them doing didactics. The students do the learning and they come to class, so to speak, in a group of their peers to share what they've learned, to ask questions, and it puts the focus on them as the learners versus the faculty putting out all of the information. And that's changed within the last five years. Probably one of the newest innovations has been our curriculum. And what does the faculty do in that context? I mean, are they just asking questions of the students or are they trying to lead the, is it more of like a case space? Um, right. learning. So there, there are specific courses, so to speak, that the students will learn and focus on for anywhere from four to six weeks, you know, gases and, um, and nutrition, et cetera. But they are given, re given uh, readings and articles and videos and a variety of ways to uh, learn on that topic. And then when they come to class, there is both clinical faculty as well as basic science faculty at the same time. So we combine both the normal and the abnormal in this case, both anatomy, for example, as well as pathology, et cetera. So the students uh, learn on their own and they interact with each other. So that it is very important for them to have those oral communication, interpersonal skills, to be able to have these discussions. The faculty are there to facilitate that, facilitate the learning 
and also to be able to provide uh, individual learning if that is necessary. But it puts the focus on the student to actually review and learn the concepts. And it, 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 it really is, um, in my opinion, when I went to medical school, we didn't have that. But when you start seeing patients and thinking about problems, it really puts you in a place of having that, that critical reasoning and, and uh, problem uh, solving. Okay, thank you. Now, Rush Medical won the Spencer Foreman Award for Outstanding Community Service from the AAMC. And there are a lot of medical schools with strong community service components to their curriculum. How did Rush differentiate itself in this highly competitive area? Well, first of all, it, uh, community service is uh, the backbone of Rush. It's it's in our DNA, and it's 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 not just a medical school; it's the entire organization. Okay. So I think that is one way we're differentiated. Is this is not just a set of um, you know opportunities for students or others to get in the community and volunteer, and then they're done. There's a commitment from the board to the senior leadership, and that is disseminated and cascades down into the organization. So uh, an example, we have philanthropic funding from uh, donors to support what we do in the community, but we also know what what the ills are in our community, the structural determinants that uh, affect people's health. And so our students, our faculty, our staff, our our, um, residents, everyone is engaged and it's interprofessional on the university side. We have the Rush Community Service Initiative Program or RICSIP, which is 30 years old and it was started by students. And what it has several components to it, education and training for our students, but also it provides care to the community and provides health literacy to the community. So the idea of what I am sure came out of the Spencer Foreman Award was not only just community engagement, but sustaining that and also measuring your your effects. So we also have metrics that we look at to make sure what we're doing is is serving the community. And that is something that we require for students for the medical school, that they have a quality background, if you will, uh, demonstration, I should say, experience of service. And not not just a a few hours volunteering in in the ER. No, and that's that is really what... um, the, when we review, we don't use the word screen, but when we review applications to decide whether or not we want to see that person in person uh, for an interview, we're looking at the quality of their experiences. So someone who may have done a couple, you know, months or or a couple weeks or something, uh, and then they're done, run and done, um, doesn't meet the um, level of our typical applicants that we see with that service orientation component. And that is because most of our, beyond the, the service requirements that the LCME has, our students come and they are engaged. They are part of um, our community and the community is part of their, their education as well. But the organization as a whole, um, it's, our mission is, de- is really uh, embedded in the community. Okay, great. It's a great answer. Thank you. Let's go in an entirely different direction, if you will. How has COVID affected the curriculum and experience at Rush for the, for the students I'm talking now? Sure. So, you know, as everyone did, we switched to virtual, um, even initially for our, our M3 students, our, our wow. third year students. Some experiences that were perhaps in the community were, were discontinued, but pretty much everything else was the same. Our third year students were put back on the floors with after a couple months. They just weren't put on um, COVID patients because of uh, concern for their safety, but otherwise they were, were um, back on their clerkships and in the hospital. Our medical students, some of our first and second year medical students, as I mentioned, we kept some classes that were um, hybrid, so Mm -hmm. anatomy, Mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, students were still able to do that. There were some programs like the what we call the Explore program, where they're able to um, look at other um, opportunities, other careers, disciplines, I should say, in person that had to be discontinued. But otherwise, um, we made a pretty good pivot from the classroom where they meet as a group to doing it online and virtually. So, um, and, and, and our, the, the one part that was difficult, and then I would think for most people was just not 
being able to see each other in person. Right. Oh, that was for everybody in any yeah, field, yeah. everybody. Yeah, I think everybody. even the, the biggest curmudgeon and introvert in the, in the world was feeling that. Yeah, but, they really miss seeing them, seeing each other. They really miss being on campus and the vibrancy of that. Uh, certainly some of the uh, RICSIT programs, being in the community and being able to do that. So that part was uh, difficult, but we just tried to make more time where we interacted with them um, even outside of the, the classroom experience to let them know we were there. Right. And what about this year? So this year, everybody is back. You know, Everybody's all, back in, everybody's in class and in, in the community, in on the wards, yep, et cetera. Everybody's back. Everybody's uh, pretty much vaccinated. We've had a, a mandatory vaccination for everybody at Rush. All our medical students, 152 of them entering this year, and the rest of them, 500 plus, are all vaccinated. So there have been opportunities for them uh, to interact. I was just with a group um, of some students. Um, at a blood drive yesterday, along with our CEO, myself, and others there. So we're, we're masked, vaccinated, and still following protocols as required by our city, as well as our governor. But um, we're in a good place right now. Great. Okay. Let's turn to the application. Any plans to go MCAT optional? Not at this point in time. We, we review you know, our MCAT requirements as a committee Every year, we review the data out of the AAMC. We review um, what, how our students do in the curriculum. And at this point, um, we're, we're still with the MCAT. Okay, great. Is research a nice to have or really important to the admissions committee at Rush Medical School? It's a nice to have. It certainly adds to um, the student's portfolio. We don't require research. So we will, we will see... Um, a, a spectrum of students who come with no research exposure, uh, some with intermediate and some with advanced. And so, but we don't require it. It does add value to their application. Um, we don't require it. And they have opportunities when they get to Rush, if they're interested in doing Rush, they are, can be uh, assigned to a, a PI, a principal investigator. They're able to look into areas and get the basics. They're able to do some more advanced work if they like, and they're able to, if they've already done it, to look for opportunities to continue it. But we certainly don't require it. Okay. Now, I know you don't like the word screen, so I'm not going to use it, but are, are secondaries automatic at Rush? They are not. They used to be. Um, we get about 10 to 11,000 applications and it goes up every year. So as we you know, bring that number down, we're reviewing. And when I say reviewing, we have eyes on, we get our faculty uh, engage with this process as much as we can, some of our staff, to look at those applications that really reflect what we're looking for. So as I mentioned before, we actually require community service exposure. That's okay. one. We require uh, there is some healthcare exposure and exposure to patients. So we don't want people coming to medicine or medical school without knowing what they're getting themselves into and, and, and later deciding this is not uh, for me. So it is a qualitative review. So if someone has done multiple, multiple, let's say shadowing or, you know, those types of things, or, you know, two weeks here, two weeks there, that's not necessarily what we're looking for. We've been a little bit more lenient with COVID because opportunities may not have been available, but we've been surprised as well of what people were able to do even with COVID, being tracers or that type of thing. So when people have community service exposure, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the healthcare environment. It can be working in a shelter. It can be teaching students. We have people who do Teach for AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps or, or whatever, just something that shows you sacrifice yourself, your time, not for employment, and to recognize that that is what medicine is about. It's sacrificing. You're doing something for the good of others, not that you're going to get remuneration for it. So that's critical. The other with uh, community service, as I mentioned, that's our backbone. Yeah. Healthcare exposure is where you have had an opportunity first to see what a doctor does, what a mm -hmm. doctor's life is like. And so and it, 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 that can be experiences in the emergency room as a medical assistant. It can be in hospice. You can even have taken care of someone 
um, yourself, but it is important to know what the healthcare setting is. It's not Grey's Anatomy necessarily and all these TV shows, but it is a team approach. People are working together for the patient. And sometimes the doctor is not necessarily the one, the, the number one person on that team. So that interprofessional piece of it, as well as though being able to talk to patients, to use your, organ, your communication skills, it's critical. So those, we look for that in all of our applicants. Obviously, we look at their metrics, which are important, particularly considering our curriculum. We want to make sure there's a good, strong foundation in the basic sciences. But we don't require any types of majors or anything like that. So we do see people who have majored in anthropology or sociology or psychology, music, et cetera. And we love that because it shows that they are have other areas of interest that they've uh, or passion that they have succeeded in. Certainly, you have to have that uh, foundation in the sciences so that you are going to be competitive and successful in medical school, but we certainly don't require, you know, someone be a, a, a science major. And do you have any minimums in terms of GPA or MCAT score? And in, in so we of have a cumulative in, in a, uh, requirement of uh, at least a 3.0. And at the moment we're looking, uh, our MCAT requirement is at 503. Got it. And above. Okay. Okay. What do you hope to learn from the secondary that you don't learn in the primary? So AMCAS is something that every student fills out for every single school in the country, and it's a standardized application. It's useful, very useful relative to giving all of the biographical information and experiences and all of that. Most supplementals or secondaries are looked, um, it's Russia's uh, application. So we, we want to know if you have had experience interacting with other backgrounds. As I mentioned, we have a very diverse community. So we wanna know if people have had an opportunity to interact with backgrounds, uh, cultures different from their own. Have they been able to have an opportunity to see what their biases are? And if so, how have you been able to manage that? We also like to know how you manage challenges. You know, so we may ask how you, give an example of, of certain situations and how you manage that. Why are you interested in Rush? What do you know about Rush? So we, you know, yeah, we're in Chicago. A lot of people want to be in Chicago, but, um, and we have five medical, medical schools, but what right. is it about Rush that, so we look for that on, on the application as well. So it's really Rush's uh, application, so to speak, or any schools that has a supplemental to really get to see, is this an individual um, that might be a fit at Rush. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Now, you mentioned that you have typically between 10 and 11,000 applications coming in. I think in the 2019-2020 cycle per MSAR, you had exactly 11,028. At least that's what it, what it said in the MSAR. Um, and you interviewed 509 and Rush matriculated 155. And I might be repeating myself here, but how do you, how do you win it down, winnow it down? So you, you discuss a little bit the reviewing that you do between the primary and the secondary, but the big cut comes in terms of inviting people to interview. Right. So it? we have a cohort of faculty who uh, review applications from the fall to through, you know, most of the probably early part of January, because we have a, a rolling admissions. And, and as we do invite people well into January, sometimes February, depending. Okay. So what we are doing when we look for who we are going to bring to interview, we're looking at their experiences. We're looking at their coursework. So part of the experiences that I mentioned to you before that we require, if someone, for example, has no uh, community service exposure or no healthcare exposure, they won't be invited. Right. It's a requirement. And the reason that is, is that when in the past we have seen people with minimal exposure in those areas, when they get to the interview, they have nothing to talk about. So if someone says, tell me, you know, about, you know, the challenges you think a physician may face, if they've never seen a physician, they can't talk. The people who interview would say, well, how did this person get through review? So part of the review is to see if you meet those criteria that we are looking for. And certainly 
The essay is also very useful because it gives a sense of the individual's motivation. But if it sounds too prepared or like, you know, it might have been something that is not that person, sometimes that may put someone to say, hmm, let me, let me invite this person and see if this is really him or her or someone else who put this together. But it's, it's really those experiences and then it's the coursework. So if someone has really done a lot of extracurricular activities or someone has taken challenging coursework in addition, for example, to their major, showing that they have curiosity, showing that they have other interests, that's interesting to the reviewer. Because we're, we're, not, we're looking for a multi-dimensional individual, not just someone with a very narrow focus, uh, because they will contribute not only to the class, uh, but their, their care of patients. So the more the, uh, diversity there is, and that's diversity very broadly, we certainly will ask that individual. And that, that's another area that I want to mention is that we are looking for those students who are underrepresented in medicine. We, we need as, a, as an academy to increase those individuals who bear some of the greater uh, morbidity and mortality in our country, in our communities. And so when we talk about community partnerships, we know what our community is. Our community is three, qu is three quarters people of color. And we look, we, we like students who are first generation in their in their family to go to college or students who come from these communities because they're the ones who when they come to our school they start the programs they want to do the work they want to go out there and interact with those folks so we look at a variety of things not just one thing but i will say we do require quality experiences in both your the healthcare exposure and their community service. So if someone has done only shadowing, which we look at as passive, but not really rolled up their sleeves to have a conversation, to build that empathy, to build that compassion, to be able to interact with a patient whose patients aren't always you know, happy. You need to know, and for students, they need to know that sick people aren't happy or they may bring their families with them. And so we'd like them to have had some exposure, not to say they have to be doing surgery and everything else, but to know what that looks like from a patient's perspective, because the second week that they're at Rush, they start seeing patients. Right. And I, th I think that, um, I like, I've never worked in a healthcare setting, but at one point I did have a, a family member who was hospitalized a lot and uh, I was with him most of the time. And it was quite clear that sometimes uh, the healthcare workers don't get treated so nicely. Um, people can be impatient. People can be unhappy. They're under a lot of stress. And the healthcare workers themselves can be under stress. So that's just kind of goes with the job. And that's so, part of it. And, and know, knowing what your constitution is, is this the type of environment you can see yourself being in? you know, for, for the rest of your life as a career, but certainly as a student, um, being able to recognize someone's pain, someone's grief, someone's anger, anxiety, those emotions that go with mm -hmm. healthcare and all, and, and be able to pick up and still take care of that patient and, and their needs is, is critical. Absolutely. What are you planning for the interview day this cycle? So our interview day is, we're, we're already interviewing. We actually, last year, our class this year was 152 because our capacity is 144, but, you know, we, students, they, they decided on Russian still came. So, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't, um, we can't say don't come, Man. but we, we're, we're planning what we're doing our, uh, we, we conduct three types, uh, two types of interviews. One is called an open interview, where it's one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member who has the applicant's uh, file, both the AMCAS as well as the supplemental in front of them, and they go through it, just you know, having uh, about a 40, 45-minute conversation. The other interview is something called situational judgment, and this is done by two different uh, people, but they're in the room at the same time asking a bank of questions of the applicant, and different situations are posed to that applicant. And one person is uh, interviewing, the other is observing, and then they switch off. And so one is a faculty, maybe two faculty members. It may be a faculty member with a fourth year medical student 
which is very, very, a lot of fun. I've been, been doing those because it's just, it's so great to see students who are in their fourth year now and they're interviewing for residency, <laughs> asking questions of these students because they have now a sense of being a fourth year student of what's required uh, and taking care of patients. They can talk about the curriculum. So that is about a half an hour interview. And from there, it goes to uh, the committee once that's com completed. Now, you say you have the situational judgment is that you, you, you do not require the CASPER, am I correct? We are not part of CASPER. Right, right. So that's kind of. I so we, saying, we ask a bank of questions based on different situations. We have, you know, our committee has different subcommittees and we have the interview subcommittee that is chaired by one of our uh, psychiatrists, our med psych psychiatrists. And so we work together as a group myself, along with the director, this physician, and others to put together these situational judgment questions. And so they are based on the competencies that have come out of the AAMC relative to what is required, not just of a medical student, but a future physician. So these competencies, you know, we, we, we certainly have academic competencies. We don't, we don't go into that aspect. But we look at you know, these competencies, which include such things as capacity for improvement, resiliency, adaptability, ethical behavior, professional behavior, et cetera. There's a whole set of competencies. And so we look and assess that in those interviews. And then in the open interview gets more to someone's perhaps their academic record. Perhaps they had a bumpy road, something happened. It gives them an opportunity to explain their actual application, whereas in a situational judgment, we don't focus on the application. We've read it right. and gone right. through it, but we're more interested in um, the attributes, those characteristics of that individual, how they might behave or give examples of how they've responded or behaved in certain situations and assess from those answers. There, there's not necessarily any right or wrong answer. It just gives us a greater degree of an opportunity of the dimensions of that individual beyond you know, just their application. Great. Thank you. Does Rush Medical consider update letters prior to waitlist status where I saw that you welcome them? So we encourage uh, our applicants anytime if they have update letters or experiences that they want to submit, they can do that. Any formal letters of reference have to go through AMCAS, but otherwise they up can, can send those. If they are on the waitlist, we, we keep in touch with them from time to time, letting them know that we do have rolling admissions all through, you know, January, February, and, 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 you know, hang in there sometimes. And if there is information, other information they want to provide, perhaps they've completed a research project or some other project, perhaps they have, you know, additional information to provide um, on an experience, et cetera. We also will uh, accept that. And at, at any point in time, they don't have to wait to get waitlisted to send that in, correct? Any point in time. Great. Okay. Now I get calls at this time of year, sometimes from parents, sometimes from applicants, actually more frequently from parents. Mm -hmm. And it goes something like this, you know, my child has these great numbers and they've all done all done all these amazing things. And they submitted their primary, they submitted their secondary, and we're not hearing a thing. Do you have any advice for applicants and their parents? on handling the silence between submission of the secondary and either an interview invitation or rejection? Because basically, if they don't have an, an interview invitation by, let's say, the end of February, they're rejected. Yeah, so first for parents, I would say very politely not to get involved. This is between, <laughs> the, two, this is between the applicant and the school. And I understand the parent's concern, but we, we tell our applicants throughout the process and you know, when they interview, if you have any questions, contact us directly. And some of that is for confidentiality purpose. Sometimes the students may not want their parents to know. I will tell you this, sometimes parents question about when their students, about their application or whatever, and they've never even applied to the school. Okay. So what, and, and so I think that autonomy we respect and, and just say, please have your, um, your Ask relative- your contact us directly be, to, to share any type of uh, information. In terms of having being you know, interviewed and, and hearing whether or not you're going to be accepted, when we interview up until, so right now, until October 15th, 
Schools cannot let anyone know whether or not they've been accepted or, or not, because the early decision programs are in play. And until those, uh, that program has ended for schools, we don't, we don't let people know. And so early decision means people have applied to just one school. And, they, and they, they find out by October 15th whether they got in or not. If they did not to that one particular school, then they open up their application um, to the remaining schools. So after that, you know, all is game. So at Rush, we try to let people know within, um, I'm going to say, uh, a couple weeks or so, if all goes well with our voting and on time, what the decision is. If someone is waitlisted, that is something that can change over time. If people have not heard anything, we, and they're on the wait list, we, as I mentioned before, we will get in touch with people from time to time to give them that a sense. But the fact that the, you know, admissions process is ongoing and rolling. So a school may enroll so many people and maybe near capacity of where they're going to be by who knows what the date is. Let, let's say it's it's uh, March or whatever. Students are, you know, declining acceptances. Some are on the wait list. Some have accepted. Some later in the cycle may decline an acceptance and then that wait list person may have an opportunity. So what we tell people is it is a dynamic process. And, you know, we do try... We don't do it every week. We don't do it necessarily every month because we're still interviewing weekly, but we do try to let them know as the cycle goes on, you know, to say, we're still doing this. You still have an opportunity and they'll contact us. They'll mm -hmm. call and say, Rush is my first choice or I really want to come there. And, um, you know, our director will, will let them know truthfully where things are and all of that. So I would say we, we prefer to hear from the student directly because there may be things about their application that might get discussed. And we just don't do that with the parents. Um, no, and, and, and part of it is because it's the student's application. And, they and they're can, adults. They can give more to the source. They get, they're more of a source of information of um, than the parents are or relatives or whomever that might be. Right. No, no, it's, uh, it's for sure. I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of the, the parents actually don't know the process very well. That's true. And, and, and the kid true. and the, and their child may not be as, as forthcoming with them as they would like. That is very, so true. I'll get the call because they're frustrated <laughs> and yeah. they, you know, they got the phone yeah. number and they'll call. So it's just a matter of, of, um, you know, being nice to them. If you want and, to and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, parents who are physicians, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the maybe mom or dad or both are physicians and they may be some time out from when they went through of course. it and things have just totally changed. And so um, that's why the students, uh, we, we really, you know, tell the applicants over and over. We have a, um, an email address that they can contact if they want to talk to someone specifically, um, they can do that. What we don't necessarily do is if someone is not accepted, is give information back at that point in time about what may have been the reason for that. We do do that if the students get in touch with us and tell us. We don't send it out for everyone. Oh, sure. And, and some do. They will say, well, what can I do to strengthen my application? And this is a review of both the um, interview and the voting comments. So we, we have to wait on that a little bit. And then if it's academics, it may be you need to strengthen your app, your academics before you reapply again, you know, that type of thing. If the committee uh, wasn't happy, perhaps with some of their experiences, maybe they need to get a little bit more clinical exposure, et cetera. That's something that is a conversation as well. So we try to have conversations with people That's and um, recommendations as well. Is that just for students who've interviewed? That you'll have these conversations or is it no, for no. a broader pool? Not, yeah, okay. anyone. All right. I'd like to shift focus more to applicants who are thinking ahead, let's say, to a 2022 application, okay? And they're now trying to figure out what they should or should not be doing. Obviously, clinical exposure is really important at Rush as at many medical schools. And you mentioned that shadowing is something where they're viewed as being passive. I assume virtual shadowing would be even more, more passive and perhaps less desirable, or, or am I wrong there? And so, is, there, so, is there any clinical exposure that's particularly good? 
Yeah, so COVID, COVID is a different uh, animal in this and we recognize that. And that's why I said we were more lenient uh, in terms of what people had the possibility to do, where they live, maybe they're in a rural environment, you know, et cetera. Maybe, they, maybe they're taking care of someone who's in their family who is ill. So we looked at that as well and, and, and you know, made, made um, conditions for that. Minus COVID though, it's okay to shadow, to get a sense of, hmm, do I like this? I, I wanna see a little bit more of this or whatever. And that's okay. But when your entire application is all shadowing, what that tells the reviewer is you have had no active participation. Watching someone is totally different than you talking to that patient. So we see people, for example, who, do, who are clinical research coordinators. And this is an excellent exposure because you actually are sitting down and talking to a patient in a clinical trial, going through the informed consent, talking about the adverse effects that uh, could happen or complications, hearing that person's concern, talking about their, the, the particular disease or condition that they're enrolling in. You're face to face with somebody and you are using your oral communication and your interpersonal skills. That's direct patient contact. But watching another physician or other providers do something is just not the same. So I'm not saying no shadowing, but when it's only shadowing, uh, that the, the, the particular reviewer, you know, may not uh, look at that as being you knowing what a doctor's life is like, or what, a, what it's like to be in a team, or what it's like to talk to a patient who, might, who may be in hospice. You know, I, I just interviewed a student a couple of weeks ago who spent time in hospice. She went in with one idea of what it was going to be like, and, you know, she de described what it was for her and the interaction with that patient, which was invaluable. So I think part of this is you don't know how you're going to react to a patient's pain. You don't know how you're going to react to a certain environment when, when you're in the middle of it, but you need to, you need to see it or have some exposure to it. It shouldn't be your first time in medical school necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and again, oral communication and those interpersonal skills are also very critical. So in an application, you can't get that, right? So in an interview, that is one competency that I would say probably most medical schools, if you don't have it, you're not necessarily going to do well in that interview assessment um, because it's seen as a proxy for how you interact with a patient. Makes sense. Makes sense. What is a common mistake that you see applicants making during the application process? They're not prepared, not being mm -hmm. prepared um, or applying at the wrong time, which is another way of saying um, not being prepared. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is I've seen people take the MCAT without having taken any of the uh, sciences that are required. Oh, they don't, I think applicants should research a school. Now, roughly students apply roughly to about maybe 13 to 15 schools. And what I always tell them, research the schools that you're applying to. For example, if you're applying to a research intensive school and you haven't done research, you're wasting your time, right? Yeah. So, donation. yeah, and 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 most schools will give the averages of their of the GPA requirements, or they all give the you know, and and I don't I don't I don't focus on MCATs, and I don't think schools do. I think they put it in in context. But I think you know, if you see if you know what your what your GPA is, and it's nowhere near or could be nowhere near that average, don't apply. You know, if, if you are not competitive yet, don't apply. If you didn't do well, so well in your coursework in college, don't apply yet. Maybe you need to do a post back. Maybe you need more time. Maybe you need a gap year. And then the other is someone, once they take an MCAT and it's not what it, it, it should be, and I'll just say that relative to what, you know, schools are looking for, don't, don't keep taking it. Put in an intervention, find out what you need to do to fix that MCAT. And it, you know, unless you just had a bad, bad day, a bad cold or a death in the family and it just threw you off your game. But we see people take it over and over again. And what they need to do is stop and reassess 
and maybe wait a year or two, maybe get some more academics in their back, uh, in their foundation before they retake it. But I would say not being prepared. And the last one is applying too late. So AMCAS opens up in June. Most schools start reviewing in July. If you're just starting to apply in September, October, you're, you don't know the school's deadline. So research each school you're applying to. Look at the deadlines. Look at when you need to have everything in for it to be considered. And if you're taking the MCAT a little bit later, look at when that school may get it. It may be too late and it might be better for you to wait the following year. Great advice. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm always uh, somewhat surprised when people get a low test score and they go and they they said, no, I was, I, I studied, I didn't have a headache. I didn't have a migraine. There was no, no good reason. I, you know, and they go study the same way, yeah. you know, go up your, up your prep game, take a different course, get a tutor, do, do something different that, that will hopefully improve the outcome. And we see people who have had taken the MCAT maybe two, maybe even three times in an interview in that open interview, that's probably going to be the first question. What did you do to make that improvement? Right. Yeah, uh, because and it's not a bad so question. Good. It's 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 like it's a good thing. It's you a good thing, and that's, yeah. that's and people are looking for that. So that's that's an assessment of judgment, yeah, of a person's judgment, their capacity for improvement. Sometimes those people just don't get the interviews, and when they contact us, as you had asked before, it may be they had been given advice, they didn't follow it, and so the 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 application doesn't move along in the process right? It might not even get through the algorithm for MCAT and GPA. Someone may not even have laid eyes on it. And when they contact us, we say, well, you didn't meet the requirements. So I say, please go to the website, look at the MSAR. If you can talk to somebody at the school, just do your homework so you know what the school is looking for so you can be prepared. And I always say the best time to apply is when you're ready. And that is physically, mentally, spiritually, but certainly academically, emotionally. emotionally yeah. Don't do it if you're not ready because it is, it's a high stake process. Dr. Barry Rothman, who's an accepted consultant and was the founder and director of several post spec programs at San Francisco State, likes to say frequently, the fastest way to medical school is slowly. That's right. And I tell people that I said, this, this is not a sprint. And I, I, I like no, to run. Me. I said, if you think about something that you do slowly over time and, and improve over time. So I think some of this you learn about yourself in the process and you may say, you know what, I'm not ready to do this. We've had people say, I want to do, I want to do this to make sure I want to do medicine. So they'll go do something else first. So right. to make sure this is truly their passion. Some people are engaged in something like maybe they're in the Peace Corps and they'll say, you know, I have another year. They'll get in and they'll say, can I defer? I have another year. Absolutely. Before I come, because I want to finish this. That adds to their portfolio for us as well. So I think it's really um, being honest with yourself, getting information from people who have done it, being honest with your with where you need to improve and then actually work on it. And please don't don't apply if you don't meet the requirements. So if you have not had any very little healthcare exposure. I'm talking particularly for Rush uh, and certainly no service orientation. Your, your application won't even get to the review stage. Okay. What would you have liked me to ask you? Well, I'll say this. I've been doing this now for longer than I thought I would. I'll just say that uh, <laughs> uh, admissions and it never really stops. There are cycles to it, but uh, at Rush, at least, we don't have um, start our class till near the end of August. We're like the second in, in the country of schools doing that. But what I enjoy about this is seeing the students when they interview. And, and I, I will have fourth year students or even students who are not. You interviewed me, Dr. Boyd. You interviewed me. And it was tough. It was I said, oh, I wasn't tough. You, but you asked some good questions or whatever. It's a joy to see people go through this process through, through their first year, their second, and you know, not, and then when they're on the floors and they're actually interacting with patients and they start talking about it and what it meant to them and all of that, and then to see them practicing or, or in, in training. 
because it's it is a process and it's oh, yeah. it's uh, one builds on the other. So I know faculty. So I know students now who were um, applicants and now they're faculty somewhere or practice oh, wow. somewhere. That's and they're doing they're uh, they're doing the work of the mission of Rush. They're in the community. I really quickly just saw again yesterday a student who graduated. Um, I think in 2000, and he is in Chicago working on anti-gun uh, viol violence in the community, COVID, and this blood drive to get more people of color to donate their blood because there's a shortage. He is a, when I saw him, I said, you are doing exactly the rush thing, and he loves it. He's an emergency medicine physician, and much, much more. He's involved. He's in leadership positions. It, it, it just, it, it, it makes me, it feel good to see that. You must um, be very proud. I mean, you have legit it, reason to well, be proud. It, it's, it's not all me. It's not. Yeah, all no, me. obviously not, but, but you're part it, of it. It's it just, it's very, it's very good to see that. And now he's mentoring our medical students. Wow. That's nice. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Boyd, uh, you've been very generous with your time. I have my eye on the clock here. And I want to thank you so much for joining me and sharing your expertise, your experience, your perspective. Where can listeners learn more about Rush Medical College? So access our website, www.rush.edu. You get a sense of our entire organization, our mission, our work in the community, et cetera. And then medical, the medical school admissions uh, page will give you everything you need to know. But if you have questions still, if that page doesn't give you all the information you need, um, just contact us. We, we like to talk about it. Okay, great. Um, I want to thank you listeners also for joining us for this wonderful interview with Dr. Boyd. We're going to include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 441 to the Rush Medical College admissions website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to you listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss the med school admissions quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash med quiz today. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.